which crucifies the world to me and me to the Jesus said, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there also will my servant be. The Father will honor whoever serves me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine yourselves those who are going to make the religious profession. Eduardo Enrique Ordenata Pimentel. Present. Ricardo Garola. Present. Elijah Joseph McClellan. Present. Raul Uriel Espinosa. Present. John George Wilson. Present. My dear brothers, what do you ask of God and of His Holy Church? To consecrate myself to God as a legionary of Christ in the service of the Church and the Regnum Christi. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Always bad news when someone pulls out several volumes to start a homily. Brothers, first of all, congratulations for your experience with Christ and your willingness to follow, even when you don't always see what's in front of you. So we share your joy and we share your trepidation, but knowing that you're in the best hands in the world as you take this step. In the late 90s, Pope St. John Paul II came through St. Louis, and a couple of us drove down from the Detroit area just to be at this Mass and the celebration. This particular day was the Mass in the TWA Dome, where the St. Louis Rams played, and the place was packed, as you can imagine. In fact, I remember this one moment when we arrived, we arrived just as the SWAT team arrived. And it never dawned on me. This is pre-2001. This is pre-9-11. And saw the SWAT team and saw them walk by. And then later, I remember doing the Mass, I looked up. And sure enough, in the catwalk, up at the top, there were six of them. And then there were three guys with binoculars. And they're just the whole time scanning the crowd. I was just fearful that one of those guns with the scope was coming in my direction. But during that Mass... And as you know, the football stadium, it has several tiers filled. And I remember there were two images that left such an impression. And it was the moment of communion, and all of a sudden these umbrellas open up, yellow and white. And to see them throughout this stadium, 
and the number of people that were receiving our Lord and the, the distribution of the bread, the sacred body of our Lord, throughout, just as the music was going on in the background, it left a lasting impression upon me. But the second one was at the end of Mass, and the final hymn was being sung, and John Paul II reverenced the altar. And as he went to leave, rather than walk the whole length of the stadium this time, he went behind the altar, and there was a little passageway with a curtain. And he was working his way in that direction. Well, then, when the people realized this, the clapping began. And the closer he was getting to that curtain, that passageway, the clapping hit a crescendo. And everybody wanted him to turn around in that one final wave. And he went right through the door. He never turned around. And I never forgot that. Because there was something in us that wanted him to just wave one last time. And for John Paul II, for St. John Paul II, he knew that his job was to point us to Christ. It wasn't about him. And brothers, as you take this step, as you surrender yourself to our Lord into his hands the way he wants things, and the where, where he wants to lead you, and as he wants to lead you, you're putting your hands in the same hands of John Paul II, or a Padre Pio, or a Catherine of Siena, or St. Monica, or Augustine, or all the saints who trusted our Lord and said, I can trust these hands. I can trust the one to whom I am making this surrender. It's not what you're giving up. It's actually what you're gaining. It's what you are receiving that you want to focus on. Samuel hears the voice and he gets up. And he presents himself to Eli. You called. No, go back to bed. Leave me alone. Goes back, comes back a second time. And then there's that strange little phrase that Samuel was not yet familiar with our Lord. Brothers, you are familiar with our Lord. And in a particular way, from this point forward, everyone who encounters you must discover a certain hallmark in you of somebody who is familiar with the Lord. That they encounter in you somebody that they know has a relationship with Him, that listens to His voice, that ponders His word, and that adjusts according to His standards. And it's that criteria, coming to the letter to the Philippians, when you are familiar with our Lord, when we are familiar with the Lord, it allows us to be able to judge things properly or to discern correctly the value of things. And St. Paul will say, I have considered all things and none of them compare to the surpassing glory of Christ, of knowing Him, but more importantly, of being known by Him, of discovering that I'm actually known by Him. And as he said very beautifully, He has grasped me. It's not what I'm grasping, and it's nothing that I'm going to do. It's first understanding that I'm known, and I'm in His hands, and He will never let me go. But that allows us to evaluate things properly and to be able to say no to things. There may have been something in John Paul II that wanted to turn around just that last time because the clapping was so loud and something in him said, that's not for me. And in religious life, and fathers and the brothers in front of you, will tell you there are many times I have to learn how to say yes 
to things I don't want to say yes to and to say no to things I would want to say yes to. But I discover that my learning how to say no at the proper time or yes at the proper time no longer is about me. But other people, other people benefit from my capacity to learn when to say yes and when to say no. So many people are attached to your profession and you haven't even met them yet. But you will in due time. And St. Paul says one last thing. Well, he says many things. That's a rich text that merits its own full homily. But in that, he says, I learn how to let go of all things, not just the good things. We even need to let go of the weaknesses, the imperfections in yourself and in those around you. And in case you haven't noticed, the Legion is not perfect, but it is an instrument of God. And in that, our Lord will work through it. And I have to let go of even the imperfections that I will sometimes see knowing that he is leading me to himself, even by way of the imperfect in me and around me. And lastly, St. Paul, he says, I consider it's not the things I'm going to do. It's not those things. What I consider is knowing how to be conformed to his death. But he says something more importantly right at the beginning. He says, because I have hope in the power of his resurrection. I can die because there's a force that's even more powerful at work by which our Lord rose from the dead. There's a love that is stronger than death. And in the gospel, when it says that that seed must die so that it multiplies, it's because... That seed, once it's united to our Lord, is so powerful. And that's when St. Paul will say that I be conformed to his death. Because his death is not just death. His death is the surrender of love. And love engulfs death. And because it does, it is fruitful. It bears fruit. I'd like to finish with something you're familiar with, but I think it bears finishing. The Christus Vita Vestra, 171. The evangelical councils bring man to the most intimate center of his being, to what is essential in his existence by leading him to a deep poverty of spirit through the renunciation of, get, of goods that undoubtedly deserve to be highly valued but must be seen in the surpassing greatness of being loved by Christ. And stripping him of occupation, securities, and human dependencies, this interior nakedness leads the soul to a very special relationship with Christ which alone gives meaning. This is a deserted place, and it is already very late. Dismiss them, said the apostles to Jesus, referring to the crowds. The twelve, however, never left his side. That's a consecrated life. Living the radicality of the councils, is only worth it when we have found in Christ the very treasure for which a person, out of joy, goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. May you experience being grasped by our Lord, being known by Him, being loved by Him, and then being sent out to transform culture because you've experienced a love that is greater than any evil, any obstacle 
that you will ever meet in this world.